Have you checked out VanillaSoft? It's a sales engagement platform, but what does that mean, right? Well, it means that you can stop your sales reps from cherry picking leads. It means they'll make more than just two or three contact attempts. It means you could potentially triple your sales pipeline. Check it out at VanillaSoft.com. Tenbound, the world's leading research and advisory firm, 100% focused and dedicated to sales development, is now announcing the Tenbound Sales Development Conference 2020. This year, we'll welcome over 750 of the top minds in sales development to two major conferences, the New York City Leadership Conference on June 18th and the San Francisco Multitrack Conference on August 17th. Join us at both and learn from the best in sales development in these one-day experiences. Gain the latest intelligence from the 10 Bound Analyst Team, unparalleled training opportunities, and networking with the leaders in our industry at the 10 Bound Sales Development Conference 2020. Go to 10bound.com slash conference to learn more. That's 10bound.com slash conference. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am very honored to introduce a guest. I think this is going to be our top show moving forward. So not to oversell it, but this is an amazing individual who I have learned so much from in our couple of brief meetings, and I can't wait to introduce everybody to. So this is Natasha Schifrin, Head of Sales Development at Creator IQ. How are you doing today, Natasha? Well, after that introduction, I'm really good. (laughs) That's made my week. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've just been kind of pen pals online for a while in the sales development space. And then we finally met when I was out in NYC. You were going to be speaking at the conference, which is awesome. Yeah, I can't wait. But hey, if you know, folks have been living under a rock and they haven't met you yet, tell us about yourself and how you got into sales development. Thank you. I'm British, obviously, <laughs> um, <laughs> in case the accent didn't give it away. Living in New York, I've been here for about five and a half years. I was living in Israel, in Tel Aviv, prior to New York, which is really how I got involved with sales development to start with. You know, the SaaS industry, the tech world out in Israel is vast and and ever growing. So I was working in like sales, real call center type work when I first moved to Israel. And honestly, that was almost a natural progression into sales development. You know, I went from one big room with lots of people on, you know, the phone to another room with lots of people on the phone, but this time selling B2B enterprise projects and breaking that the whole sales process into real, I guess, areas of focus, which is, you know, what what leads us to inside sales. And so for me, it was just this natural progression of, you know, I needed a job in English. I worked in a call center and I was lucky enough to be in a country where, you know, they needed English speakers and it was like a foot in the door to this whole world of inside sales and technology. And the rest is history. This is my third company now managing inside sales or sales development teams. And I started, I want to say around 2012. So it's been about eight years now. Been in sales for longer, but specifically sales development eight years. Amazing. Okay. So now you're running a team and, you know, we were talking a bit about how, you know, your point of view is a bit different in how you train and how you think about working with the sales development reps. And I want to talk a little bit about how are, you know, you working with the reps to get them up to speed and to run your teams? Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely been an evolution for me of of growth myself and understanding what I can change within myself to get the most out of my team and then for them to be successful. And it, it kind of led me to this place of, leading from within. I don't want to have to change who I am as a person in order to be a successful leader. And for me, it's about authenticity and and communication. I don't get it right all the time, but that's really what I try and focus on in, in my interactions with people is how am I communicating with them? Am I really listening to what they're saying or am I just waiting to speak myself am I really listening or am I sitting there wondering what they think of me or did I mess up and when I spoke to someone yesterday and oh gosh I probably shouldn't have said that and we're never really present because we're all of us majority of us are constantly 
fretting and worrying? Are we coming from this place of either mild embarrassment, a little bit of shame, or maybe fear? We're scared of something, and that prevents that true connection. And this isn't just work related, I just think this is how the world works for me. And so I think about this and I'm like, well, you know, it's relevant to sales because what we do is communication. We have to communicate with our prospects, our targets, our customers. We have to understand what they really want. We have to have them listen to what we're saying as well. So if we can authentically communicate on just any level, it's only going to be better for us at work as well and to help us be successful. And also with my team. And like I said, I don't always get it right. You know, I definitely make mistakes sometimes, but I really try as much as possible to have that element of compassion and understand, you know, if they react in a way that maybe I wasn't expecting or was maybe lacking a bit of professionalism, my initial reaction these days is to be like, okay, why are they reacting like that? And what can I do to improve their environment or their situation to make them feel safer, right? So they can feel comfortable so we can have a real conversation and they'll be open to new ideas and to growing and learning. And it's a tricky situation because in sales and sales development, especially there's so many high expectations for you know, how many people that you talk to every day and how those conversations are going and how you're producing results. You know, you've got to set the meetings and the salespeople want, you know, more meetings and, you know, the marketing department wants you to follow up on the leads and there's so much pressure there. How do you get out of your own head and be more empathetic and put yourself into the shoes of the other people? Because I completely agree with you. I think that that is... That's the key to great communication. But how do you encourage your team to do that? And how do you do that yourself? Yeah, look, it's taken me years. Right? Yes. Uh, I'm sure if you speak to some of my reps from you know eight years ago, they'll be like, who is this? What is she talking about? <laughs> like, that, is not, that is not my recollection of Natasha managing me. Well, you change. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. You evolve. Exactly. And I think that the fact that I've evolved and grown <laughs> and been open to learning myself has, has allowed me to put myself in the shoes of, okay, okay, they're where I was 10 years ago. What was beneficial to me? How did I pull myself out of there? But to go back to your specific question, you have all of this pressure and we do, we get battered. Sales development get battered from every which angle. Marketing are having a go at us, sales are having a go at us, you know. It's really, you're right, a lot of pressure. And I think understanding that there's more than one path to an opportunity, right? And I think coming in now to 2020 and all the tools and all the ways we can communicate has opened that up. Like my team don't make a huge amount of phone calls here, but that doesn't mean that we're not setting the right number of meetings for people. It just means that we're we're getting a little bit more creative and understanding that, like I said, there's more than one path. Like the days of you have to make 80 phone calls a day, doesn't like that anymore on these type of metrics. Yes, 100%. And so when you're trying to balance that pressure with the team and to try to have them, you know, lead by example in doing this, and we, it's a hard thing that we're asking them to do, is there some you know, advice that you could give people or ways that we could go about doing this? Because I need to do this myself. I'm thinking about relationships, you know, not just in sales. I mean, sales is a great, it's like a self-help, you know, course every day because you have to get better in order to sell. But in just life, I mean, how do you get out of your own head and put yourself into somebody's oh, shoes? This is, the, <laughs> this is the question, right? It's, I think first you have to want to be on that path right? Like with anything, you have to really be ready and understand that if you want to make changes, you are going to be the agent of those changes. I think it's important to be patient with yourself and understand that when you start on the journey, you're still going to get it wrong more than you get it right. The key is to be gentle on yourself when you do get it wrong but also to be mindful of the times when you get it wrong and you get it right and when you do get it wrong is 
What was helpful for me was to try and understand why did I react that way? What was it that that person said to me or the way that they said it or that put me in a position that I reacted a certain way? And I think if you can understand that, you can be a little bit more in control of it. And again, it's, you know, it's not like with the team, I'm sitting here and I'm having these types of conversations with them. It just helps me communicate with them. And it helps me firstly to provide coaching and and knowledge. It also puts me in a position to allow myself to learn from them. I think that's been huge as well is not just because I have the title head of sales development and just because I've been doing it quite a bit longer doesn't mean that they still don't know how to do things better than than I do for sure a generation that understands how they can use social media better than I can you know so I think also putting yourself in a position where I'm open to hearing what they you know that's a terrible way of doing it Natasha can we do it this way please and, and <laughs> thinking, okay sure so it sounds like your ego is not getting in the way like you don't have to be right about everything it's a little bit more I'd like a, to be right yeah. About everything I do, but I understand <laughs> that I'm not. I'm not always. Yes. Right. Okay. I, it was it's amazing. I actually was speaking to someone yesterday about ego and that how ego has a really bad reputation. You know, these days it's always oh, it too much ego. Does it? Actually, ego does have a place, and ego has a place when it brings joy brings happiness you know so for me when I have an interaction with someone and I leave and go oh I nailed that that was really really great I shouldn't be like oh that's just your ego speaking that's no you should be celebrating and when ego you might need to dampen it is when it leaves you with more of that negative feeling but we shouldn't remove ego from the conversation it's ego that allows SDRs to just pick up the phone and call a stranger (laughs) right Right. it's like Ego versus confidence and celebrating the wins. I mean, like, you know, it's important to also acknowledge when you're, something's going right, because I think that we could diminish that. And, you know, we're asking the team to call on people who might not be expecting the call or might not be expecting the email. We're kind of, it's not interrupting per se, but there could be a negative response from people. So, how do you deal if, you know, you get a negative response or no response at all to try to put yourself into their shoes. This happens quite a lot, actually. I have quite a young team at the moment. And of course, it's like, oh, you know, they said they were going to email me back and they haven't. And I remind them, what does your day look like today? Like your day is, open your calendar. Their calendars are blocked. They're SDRs. They don't have any gaps in their calendar. I was like, I'm sure the person you're trying to connect with has a very similar looking calendar. Yes. Do not take it, breathe, wait 24 hours. And I know the other thing is it's it really, it goes against how I was as an SDR at the beginning. You're taught from de- instant reaction. If you don't contact a lead within the first five minutes, the chance to connect with them exponentially drops. We all know this. We all know these statistics. We know it to be true. So that kind of drives every aspect of what we do as sales development. We just assume that that's the rule for everything when it comes to sales development. And it's not when you're like waiting for a response or you get a negative response. Well, they're probably, no, excuse my language here, but typically people aren't assholes. You know, the majority of people just aren't. You probably caught them at a really bad time on a really bad day and they lashed out at you. So, you know, take a step back, send an email apologizing catching them at a bad time and either you'll never hear from them again or my experience people just want to be heard you know all right back and say yeah I'm sorry can we set a call for next week it's really busy now or I'm really sorry but no we're not interested like people aren't going out of their way to be mean or upset anybody so it's like very helpful to remind the BDRs and the SDRs of that like it's less about you and what you did and more about that individual. Got it. And and what do you do when they come to you and they're just like, look, I've tried everything, you know, I'm reaching out, I'm, I'm following the program and it's just nothing's working for me. You know, where do you begin in that kind of conversation? Because I feel like that's one that 
you know, we've all had if we're managing these teams? I like to start from the very beginning of the process with them. Like I said, that not only is there more than one path to an opportunity, but each one of those paths is broken up into tiny little steps, you know. So start the very first step. Okay, what are you doing here? How are you doing it? Right? Let's think of, is there maybe another way? So firstly, choosing accounts to work. Why are you choosing those accounts? Okay, maybe there's a better way or a different way. Don't say better. I mean, there's a different way to choose accounts. Have you thought about setting up Google Alerts for job alerts in your city? For me, that's a really great way to understand if companies are going to are ready to invest resources in the vertical I'm working in right now. So there's lots of things you can do really, really instantaneously to help change the way people are doing every step of their path. Once they've chosen their account, okay, what contacts are you choosing within that account and why? And walk through, hold their hand through every step of the way and just keep asking the why questions. SDR them the same way you would do a prospect. Just keep asking those why questions. Why are you doing it that way? Is there another way? Challenge the status quo that they have of doing things. And you'd be surprised. Reps that come and say, I'm really doing everything, they are in their reality. In their reality, with their experience and what they know, they probably are really doing things. But what helps is having someone who has a different reality coming in and doing a almost a side-by-side. Side. Okay, well, maybe there is another way to do this. So I find that's Got it. helpful. And you start to unpack it almost like a reverse engineering the whole process for them. Yeah, that's a great, <laughs> better way of putting it. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes they'll be able to turn it around and it's just like a motivational issue. But I guess, you know, is sales something that people are just born with? Or can people who are not necessarily a salesperson, you know, deep down in their personality, can they actually learn the skill and turn things around? Oh, it's the age old question. Yes. <laughs> you, know, you go through where every time you're hiring, and I have all the cliches, there's skill versus will. So to go back to your question, yes, I think sales can be taught but only if there's a will there okay you know i think there has to be a really strong will a desire to be good at sales and to embrace it even if it's not natural it doesn't come talking to strangers doesn't come naturally to you but you really want it you want the end result of selling and then you have you know the tangible learn the product this is how you date an email i think the intangibles are things like curiosity and fearlessness I think if people have that, the fearlessness that, again, they're not afraid just to put themselves out and to experiment as well. Like, I'm going to try a new email format and not to be afraid to get poor results from it. Like, that's also what prevents us from experimenting a lot of the time is we just, we don't have time to fail. No. So you need this fearlessness and you need the curiosity to keep asking questions and, and to keep learning. So I think if people have that you can probably teach them the majority of those hard skills. Most people refer to VanillaSoft as the solution. It's the solution to ensure sales reps make the right number of attempts for every lead across all channels, including email, social, and the phone. It's the solution to serve the rep the next best lead every single time. You need to get your solution at VanillaSoft.com. And have you ever gotten in a situation where you hired someone and you thought, you know, they've got all the material, raw material to be great at this. We're really going to knock it out of the park. And then it turns out that they didn't have some of those intangibles. Absolutely. I used to work for an analytics company. And so we did full on regression testing on our hiring process for sales development reps. Wow. Okay. You know, and, you know, you come up with all of these theories and you think this time we've nailed it. I know you haven't. It doesn't matter. In my, this is my experience, right? I'm sure we can have people comment and ping you and let you know that actually they've mastered the art of hiring. No, that absolutely. I've brought people in that have ticked every of those intangible boxes. They scored well on the matrix that we created with the regression testing and they've still not succeeded. And that can be sometimes just a culture issue within the organization can sometimes create that kind of environment. I think if, again, their heart just turns out to not really be in it, 
it's frustrating as a leader when you see someone who has so much potential. Again, the experience I have, and I can only speak from there, one of the challenges with sales development is, you know, we often ask for people with experience, but the reps who come with experience, they just want to become an AE. And I would say that some of the more challenging SDRs that I've managed in my career, the ones that you're talking about, where they tick every single box, but you just cannot, you cannot get the performance out of them. And typically it's because they accepted the role as a stepping stone to get to AE and they didn't really want to embrace the sales development role. You know, they were doing it to, as I said, check that box. It's so interesting because, you know, you hear a lot that people want to hire someone who wants to progress in the company and, you know, keep moving up through the company. And yet you also run into that issue a lot where they hire people that don't necessarily want to do the job that they're yeah. hired for. And so it's like, exactly, it. it's very rare that you hear about someone who, you know, wants to hire someone to be just do the SDR job. I mean, it's like, it's always a stepping stone to something mm-hmm. else, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've played around with the idea. I think there is a role for like career BDRs in the enterprise world. And I know a few, I know a few excellent, excellent BDRs who are career BDRs. They enjoy the instant gratification of the role when you're working on a one-to-one relationship with an AE and you get a little bit of rev share from those huge enterprise deals that close, it can be a really nice. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. And it's a, <laughs> look, that in itself is a skill. Breaking into these Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies and being able to pin down a VP or C-level to a meeting that should be celebrated as a skill in itself. And I do think there's a few people out there who would and could do it, provided the organization is going to reward them. Like I said, they need that one. It has to be true enterprise, I think. And this one-on-one relationship with the account executive, very, very strategic and a decent commission structure with a red share. Right. And you would think that that person would be celebrated, you know, as like, I mean, they're doing one of the hardest jobs out there and it's not like they're just going to be around for 12 months and then get promoted, Um, creating all this pipeline and, you know, they have a great attitude. I've known people like that. And I think just on my soapbox, they should be really respected and and honored within the organization. Yeah. And I've been pretty lucky that the companies that I've worked with, the SDRs and BDRs have always been held in pretty, pretty high regard which is great. I think that does come down to the leadership. I'm so passionate about the role. I love sales development. I truly do. And I think that helps. I'm a huge advocate for my team. And, you know, I'm not afraid to muscle my way into a meeting. Go, oh, by the way, that was my rep. You know? <laughs> make sure, make yeah. sure the whole company knows that when a big deal comes in, you know, that it's not just the account executive that gets the rounds of applause. No, that wouldn't have even happened if it wasn't for one of my reps. So I think there's an opportunity for sales development leaders to shift that as well. 100%. And it becomes that confidence and standing up for your team and elevating the role. And I wanted to ask you too, you know, for you as someone who's accomplished in the sales development space, and then you see kind of the future of sales development over the next few years, where do you see the role going as a sales development leader? And then where do you see kind of the industry going? I mean, I know it's a big question, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts if you ever thought about that. Yeah, I don't think the role itself is going anywhere. You know, it started off really as appointment setters, right? The early days of Oracle creating this role. I think that's where Mark Benioff probably got, you know, the idea at Salesforce and this whole, the predictable revenue and everything was just to break up the sales role into these different functions where you can focus. You have sales development, amazing. And they've evolved from appointment setters. And then it was this idea of qualification. I mean, What we're asking sales development reps to do these days is they might as well be closing at some point. (laughs) The amount of discovery that needs to happen. But I still think there's the need to separate 
that focus between the closers and the qualifiers. So I don't really see that going anywhere. I think the advent of all the technology is going to shift more how the BDR spend their time. Like I said, there's less phone calls because organizations don't have phones anymore. Unless you're lucky enough to get someone, you know, JP Morgan, Coca-Cola, about eight years ago, they all took, you know, their desk phones and voicemails and everything they ripped out. The last few companies, we have cell phones and Skype or Slack or Zoom, you know, so people aren't really calling in. There's, you know, a head office number on the website to typically go to a voicemail. And then you, you have the automated email and the AI, you know, Conversica, Exceed now doing all the AI emailing. I see more and more vendors popping up all the time there. So where I think this idea of personalization and again, communication and relationship building is going to become more emphasized within the BDR role. The popularity of video and Vidyard, I think, is a good example of how that's progressing and that idea of creativity, how my reps are using LinkedIn as well. You know, it's a slightly less formal. They're reaching out to peers on LinkedIn. So I do think like the new generation of BDRs and SDRs are going to look totally different to how I did eight years ago. So yeah, it was a long winded. I think the role is going to stay the same, but how we spend our time is going to differ. I think it's going to be more fun and more creative. I think those vanity metrics, like how many calls did you make today are going to be gone. And it's more to do with how many people were you able to engage with and how creative can we get to increase that engagement? Okay, I got two questions for you because there's a debate that goes on about the phone. And, you know, I tend to agree. I just look at how I work on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You know, if the phone rings and I don't immediately recognize the number, I probably will let it go to voicemail. And most organizations don't have desk phones anymore. So, but there's like a raging debate and it's mostly from people that have some kind of phone tool, you know, and they're like the phone, you got to call people and all this stuff. So I think it has a place and I can give you an example inbound with the inbound leads. You can call, they've requested a demo. My current company, all inbound leads come in through a demo request on the website. They leave their phone number. Now we can email them and wait a week for them to finally schedule a meeting or we can pick up the phone and call them and the meeting scheduled. Boom. Okay. You know, so yeah. calling definitely has a place. So I think it depends on the organization and the market that you're running into. Just the teams that I've been exposed to in my most recent recent years, I see it. It definitely still has a place, but I'm not relying on it as much anymore, especially when you're doing outbound work. Right. I think you that that creativity, I'd rather my team get really, really creative with direct mail ideas and videos and visuals from the product they can throw into the email and the people that they're, they're trying. And I think, you know, all of our cadences, by the way, all of our outbound cadences still have phone calls in them. We're still making phone calls, but this idea of calling five times a day, I think is slowly going to peter out. It's creepy. And then what about you know, in five years from now, if you read some of the posts and everything, there are no sales development reps anymore. There's no BDRs. Everything's automated and computers and robots and things like that. And I tend to agree with your hypothesis about where it's all going. I, I think, but I don't want to load the question. So are, <laughs> are there going to be any BDRs in five years and, and stuff like that? Or is, I or believe, is personally, be I like hope that? so. Because this is my <laughs> this is my bread and butter. I know. So it's that, like in my thing. interest to say yes, <laughs> yes, we're gonna be here. It's how we I start just don't understand what, what's the what's the alternative? Because if the robots are if nobody's kind of monitoring what they're doing and then this the sales exactly reps it. are not prospecting because they're just waiting for the appointments to be set, then Who's going to do it? But sorry. This is exactly it. Firstly, I mean, yes, the automation, everything's going to improve. Right now, it still needs like a human there every step of the way. Also, we don't trust the technology yet, right? So I feel that we, we are still dipping in and checking everything. So what email did it or what did the bot just say on my chat? 
on the website. Have I programmed that correctly? Is it working the way it's meant to work? There's an element of trust that's preventing us from going all in with the technology. I'm sure that will shift over the next five years. But we started the conversation talking about communication and relationships and that authentic relationship. And that, I like to think, is only ever going to be human to human. I like to believe that the machines and the AI are not going to replace that element of authentic communication with people. And that's why we still are going to have BDRs, because that's why people will respond. Unless you catch someone at the exact right time, like your email happens to drop into their inbox the same hour that they were speaking to their boss about needing a tool for something. You know, that's great when that happens, but you need to build these relationships. And it can't just be email drip campaigns where everyone in the company is getting on the receiving end of the same email. That's not what is going to have people engage with you or your product. They want to know that there's a human behind there who's listening to them and understanding what it is that they really, really need. Got it. And so, you know, just to put a bow on it, it's, if you really want to stand out in this world of automation and robots and tools that can do everything, you have to develop those very human relationship skills that you're talking about and you actually lead with in your leadership style. I hope so. Yes. I love it. All right. So you gave us a lot of homework to work on. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to dive into this at the conference in June. Natasha, this is great, great recommendations. Thank you so much for imparting all your advice and we'll see you in a few months. See you in a few months. Thanks, David. (laughs) All right. And thanks for joining us on the Sales Development Podcast. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.